Hello, and welcome to the Inside EVs podcast for June the 3rd, 2020. This is episode number 13. Today, we'll be talking about Tesla beats delivery expectations, Audi e-tron S debuts, Xpong delivers first P7. I'm Dominic Chioni, Inside EVs editor and Inside EVs forum moderator. Joining us today, we have Tom Malogny, multiple EV owner and Inside EVs editor. We also have Martin Lee from the EV News Daily podcast, available on all your usual podcast platforms. And of course, we have Kyle Connor from the Out of Spec Motoring and One Lap YouTube channels. He also puts together super awesome videos for the new Inside EVs YouTube channel. Go subscribe and tap that bell icon for notifications. So uh, welcome, gentlemen of the panel and ladies and gentlemen of the audience. Uh, lots to talk about, but before we get to the big news, uh, what do we have charged up in our driveways this week? Now, I guess this week's a little bit different. Tom, you, you've you you've been sort of renting a car of sorts. Why don't you tell us about that? <laughs> well, I actually have a couple things going on. I just picked up a uh, 2019 BMW i3s, uh, and uh, I'm going to do range and charging tests on that, but I haven't done anything with that yet. I just picked it up. Um, what I did do a range test on was a brand new uh, 2020 Tesla Model Y uh, dual motor long range. A uh, friend of mine, local person that has Toro vehicles available, he rents out Teslas, um, just got in uh, his first Model Y. So I had told him, as soon as you get one, let me know. I want to take it for a day to do some range testing, which I did yesterday. It was a really great day for it. And uh, we haven't even posted this on Inside EVs yet, uh, so we'll give the podcast listeners a little advance. Um, we, I was able to drive it 275 miles and get a consumption rating of uh, 260 watt hours per mile, which converts to three, about 3.85 miles per kilowatt hour. For our European friends, that's about 16.1 uh, kilowatt hour for 100 kilometers. So it's a fairly uh, efficient vehicle, uh, the third best efficiency um, that we've tested behind the Model 3 and the Hyundai Ioniq. Um, really cool vehicle. I liked it a lot. As, 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 as many of you know, I'm a Model 3 owner, so I was at home inside the cabin. It's basically a Model 3 that's just bigger. It's got a ton of interior space, beautiful full glass roof, uh, which was really nice. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's a big model three it drove great, uh, handled really well for a crossover. Uh, but there's one, a couple of things I have to uh, note, uh, you know, um, went over the vehicle when I first got it and, uh, you know, as, as we've come to, you know, accept the early Tesla builds aren't great. And, uh, you know, the panels weren't too bad. There, there were some things that I personally want fixed if it were my vehicle, um, but then there were a couple other things that were unacceptable. Uh, there was uh, under the front uh, passenger side wheel well, there was a, a wiring harness that was just hanging out and dragging on the ground. Uh, I had to tuck it underneath and tape it uh, so I wouldn't damage it. I, I'm not sure what it's for, but um, that's how the vehicle was when I got it. And uh, the person just took possession of it five days earlier. Um, so that was a little disappointing. Uh, and then I, as I was driving the vehicle, I was getting in and out of it to shoot some videos. When I, when I closed the passenger side front door, the uh, speaker fell off. The speaker that's in the front corner of the window, it just oh. fell off. And uh, I had to grab it and uh, snap it back into place. Uh, so that was a, another thing that was a little disappointing. And then uh, as I was uh, taking pictures in the back of the back seats, I noticed that uh, on the driver's side rear door panel, the, um, the, the, the plastic padding had a nice tear in it. And I, I quickly called um, my friend just to make sure he was aware of this. I don't want him to think that I did this with my equipment while I was taking pictures or videos. And he said, no, nah, he knew that he, he said that he knew he saw that he went, it was the car was delivered that way and he made note of it already. So, um, you know, those, those were some pretty, pretty disturbing things on a brand new car. And then to make matters worse, um, we don't have pictures of this, but the rear hatch didn't, doesn't close properly. Um, it has an automatic rear closing hatch, the Model Y, 
and uh, it every time it clo closed down, it would the top of the hatch would bang the top of the rear tail light. The tail light, it, it actually has the plastic is chipped now, and it kind of closes one side and then the other side, and then pulls itself closed. So um, these are some pretty significant things that should have been caught in quality control. Uh, I don't know if. Tesla's doing quality control now because to, for those major things to get through, a wiring harness dragging on the ground, the you know speaker not being properly attached, and uh, the rear hatch not closing properly to the point where now the rear tail light's going to have to be replaced because it's cracking it when it closes down on it. Uh, you know it's unfortunate. Uh, we talked a little bit about Tesla having the lowest initial quality in a recent survey in our last podcast and. You know that we're not making that up, and, and neither are the people that collected that data. That said, people love their Teslas. They still have the highest customer satisfaction. I still love my Model Three, but uh, you know when we see the stuff, we have to report on it. Now, I, I wasn't intending on reporting on Tesla quality. It was I rented it just so I could do the the, the seventy mile an hour highway range test, uh, which I did, and as I said, we finished up with two hundred and seventy five miles, a hundred percent. I drove it down to zero and uh, was able to use uh, 72 kilowatt hours were available, um, which is uh, what you would expect on the new, uh, new Model Y. Uh, so, but, but, but when you see things that are this egregious, you, have to, you just have to report on them. But shouldn't that, uh, <laughs> this might be stating the obvious, isn't there something that should be plugged into? I suppose, Martin. Uh, you know, I, I, <laughs> like, it's bad enough that it's hanging out, but where's it meant to be? You know, right. I, 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 I had the car for a day. I rented it, and I didn't want to take too much time figuring things out. So, like I said, I, I took my, my tape, taped it, and tucked it in underneath and told <laughs> my friend, hey, this, this better get fixed. You know, maybe it has something to do in the front headlight area. Uh, you know, yeah. I, I um, you know, it, it didn't seem to affect the drivability of the car, but uh, yeah, that needs to get looked at. That's that's that more. That's more than an ABS sensor or a brake pad. Where so that's quite a chunky. I cable. actually think that's for the little speaker in the front for the noisemaker. Oh, the noisemaker. Oh, well, in that yeah, case, the area it would be. That's in. That's the right area. Okay. Good point. And it, do they? It should have a noisemaker, though, right? They do now. Some came installed in. and some were forgot to be put in, <laughs> is what I understand. Oh, you've well, seen this I before? I didn't hear anything. So <laughs> well, they're not, none of them are turned on in Model Y. Oh, uh, that's yeah. amazing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, none of them are turned on, but some Model Ys have the actual speaker and some don't. I see. Well, maybe that's yeah. why it's hanging out. It doesn't have anything to plug into. Right. It was just dangling around. <laughs> right. Not a good well, not a good day for speakers. Man. That's right. And, but it's again, clear that again, Tesla really I'm needs not. Tesla really needs to step up their quality control coming out of the factory. There's you know, there's you charge this much money for a car and and I would expect everything buttoned down like perfect. Fifty grand, I, I you know, I want uh, I want perfection, basically. And that's that's not it. You're not going to get that with Tesla. They'll initially. make it good, though. I mean, I mean we should point out. They'll yeah, always they'll, make, they'll it make it good. good. You always have to go for one service visit after taking delivery of your car. I've had to do it with every Tesla I've had, every Tesla my parents have had. You get right. the car, you make note over the week, <laughs> and then you drop it off. You drive their loaner car on a big road trip, and then you uh, then you get your car back. Right. And, and I, I, other car companies have these kind of issues too, maybe, but I don't think to this extent, this just seems like, you know, yeah. I, I don't know. Depends on yeah. the car. The, right. The thing right. about it is the mistakes are so egregious that, as I mentioned earlier, it, it appears as though there's no QC department. Like when the cars roll off the uh, assembly line, they just roll directly onto carriers and, and ship out. And then as Kyle said, they say, okay, if anybody has a problem, we'll fix it later. And they do. So, you know, I don't know, maybe maybe that's the new norm. Maybe maybe, maybe, maybe that's how the cars are going to be made now. We're just not used to that. I certainly am not. But um, as I mentioned earlier, I still love my Model 3. I wouldn't trade it for anything. Um, but it's, it's definitely strange that, you know, we get this many defects on brand new cars. Hey, so, hey, Tom. So going back to your your range test, was that at seventy miles an hour? And what what is the what is the uh, EPA range on that? 
Yeah, so it's EPA range rated at 316 miles per charge. Okay. And yes, at 70 miles an hour, Kyle and I have been trying to do the 70 mile range tests on every vehicle that Inside EVs gets on loan so that we can compile a comparative chart and, um, you know, get, just give readers uh, something, another metric to look at. Like we, we both openly say this isn't the greatest way to test range. It's just one and one more piece of data for people to look at. If you're driving down the highway at 70 miles an hour, this is about what you can expect to get under the conditions we had. Um, and one thing that I note in the video um, when, when it's posted is um, what I was a little surprised about, I shouldn't have been, was that I had to, I'm so used to leaving my, my Model 3's fan setting at like a three, and it pretty much does, even when it's super hot out, it, it, it keeps the cabin cool, but the, the Y is so much bigger, it has so much more space, I had to have it up to the fan level setting five, it was a warm day yesterday, it was over 90 degrees, so I'm sure that robbed a decent amount of range where I was just pumping that cold air the whole time. Um, so, you know, I would imagine if there was no air conditioning going, you know, I might've gotten 285 miles of range, but as it is at a constant 70 miles an hour under the conditions I drove yesterday, we did 275 miles, a hundred to zero. Right on. Uh, what's, uh, what's, what size tires did that have? It had the standard 19 inch tires with the new, um, got to forget, what are they called again? Kyle probably knows the new Gemini or something like that. What's that? Gemini Aero covers. Yeah, the Gemini Aero covers. Yeah, which I really like. They look cool. Gemini Aero covers. Oh, oh, I think I've seen those. Yeah, they're just the new stock wheels. Right, but they're not yeah. on the three, just the Y, right? Three uh, Y and Model S, not okay. three. Yeah. Okay. I would prefer having those over the stock because I have the stock eighteen-inch wheels on my three, and I take I take them off. I, I don't like them at all. If these were the, the the covers on mine, I would definitely leave them on. I, I think they look nice. Yeah, nice. they look pretty nifty. I saw a Model S on them the other day, and it looked pretty good. And that was obviously one of the new 400-mile Raven cars, which is pretty cool. Sweet. Hey, so Kyle, so you have uh, you you don't necessarily have a car yourself this week, but you do have a big trip coming up that you want to tell us about? Right. I just canceled my... Uh, press rotation because uh, of this trip. So they picked up the car. It wasn't an EV. It was a Kia Seltos, nothing exciting. Uh, they picked that up just yesterday, two days ago. Uh, but back to Tom's point about Model Y, I, I spent the day with Model Y yesterday as well. Uh, my friend Brian from I1 Tesla came up and we were drifting it around the racetrack and doing a whole bunch of silly stuff as we always do. Uh, but I, uh, we took the back seats out of the car, which was kind of interesting. And they had a lot more connections than model three. So we couldn't quite figure out what that was all about. Um, yeah, you can see him dismantling all of the wires there. Um, we also did a range test on this car, uh, the day he took delivery of it, but we were not able, uh, to do the proper way of driving it down to zero. I had to extrapolate with data, but I figured about a 74 kilowatt hour usable. And I've noticed Tesla's when they're fresh drive a little bit past zero. So, Tom, I think you may have been able to get a little bit more. Not that any reasonable person would have done that. Um, I think that you, I mean, no one will do range tests better than than our method of running it down to zero percent. That's the only true way to measure capacity in a range. Uh, so, when I did mine for out of spec, I I think I estimated 272, 274 miles on the performance version, which is crazy because those 21 inch wheels seem to be more efficient than the 20 inch wheels, which is kind of interesting. Not than the 19s, but um, not sure what's up with that. I thought that was kind of interesting. Also the 20 inch wheels you can't tow as much on with Model Y. I believe Steven had a story up or was working on one on that. Anyway, uh, right, so we have no EVs in our driveway uh, other than the ones that we own and we're taking the Model 3 performance on a one or two month or three month or however long we go excursion around the country. And uh, we will be overlanding with the vehicle. So we're going to be uh, camping and living out of the car. We'll have a, a you know really nice tent. We'll bring the dogs with us. We're going to go to, you know, Glacier National Park, Yellowstone, uh, Grand Teton, the Salt Flats, Moab, the Grand Canyon, all, you know, all the stuff that you got to see living in America. Alyssa's never been to any of these places. I'm fortunate wow. where I've 
done every state now except Alaska. That'll be the next road trip. Uh, so yeah, it's going to be a really cool trip. We are uh, planning anywhere between ten and 15,000 miles. We're just going to take it easy, no rush, charge at campgrounds, uh, maybe run out of charge a couple times. It'll be kind of fun. We're going to document the whole thing uh, in a uh, like an overlanding excursion series on our YouTube channel for out of spec motoring. And then we'll highlight the, the really interesting things on the inside EVs channel. So for example, we'll do efficiency testing with the roof rack that we got. Yakima is giving us a, a really nice roof rack for the trip. So we're going to do it mounted forwards. And then I've heard if you mount a roof bo box backwards, it gets better efficiency on model three. So we're going to have to test that as well. Nice. Three months, four months. I, did, I had no idea that you were going to, you were going to do it for that long. That's, that's a heck of a Right. Trip. So the basic plan is it's at least going to take us a month and likely six weeks. And so while we're out there, you know, I, I, we're going to do this pole star drive. So I need to leave for that. But, but basically Pike's peak in Colorado is the last weekend in August, I believe. And uh -huh. since we're already going to be out there and I'm going to go out and film videos for the Pikes Peak team for the Inside EVs YouTube channel and other things watching it go up, I figured Sweet. we may as well just stay out there. <laughs> you know, there's I work remotely, so it's not like we right. necessarily need to be home. So you're going to be at Pikes Peak this year. I'm so jealous. Oh, man. Right. There's no spectators allowed, unfortunately, but we'll right. be with the team filming and stuff like that. So Right. We'll or, there'll be media, I'm sure. Yeah, it's potential. I'm not quite sure are in yet, but we'll have some sort of in. We'll keep it safe with people. I think it's a smart decision to keep it spectator free. Uh, sure. One, it's extremely dangerous for spectators from vehicles being hurled at the crowd. Uh, and also uh, just the general uh, virus situation doesn't seem to be getting better. So I think that makes a lot of sense. Our trip, uh, you know, obviously we're going to take as many precautions as possible. And one of those is camping in the middle of nowhere. We are going to be not in city centers. We'll be literally, we're going to North Dakota. No one even lives in North Dakota. We'll be totally fine. Right. <laughs> and, and you can mask up when you go into stores or, or whatever. Right. Of course, you know, we'll, we'll have all of our precautions. I mean, the, the thing that we think about is we live at a destination spot here in North Carolina, everyone traveling up and down I-95 will stop here and whatever virus they have, they're bringing right into our front door, right? Basically this restaurant across the street. So we're going to go away from everyone is our idea. So it should be interesting in the next few uh, podcasts to see exactly where you are. We track your podcast. Your right. Well, that there. might be interesting. I mean, I, I imagine obviously we're going to plan on Fridays to be in places with good Wi-Fi uh, so that we can do our show. I, it may or may not happen where, we're just not going to have the service. Obviously, we'll have our phones. We'll try and stream. We'll go to McDonald's, whatever we can find that has good Wi-Fi. But if I miss a, miss a show, I really apologize. But but we're planning to to have Wi-Fi every Friday for this. Right on. So before we move on to news, uh, Tom, I just wanted to ask you if you wanted to give your friends uh, uh, Tesla Turo business a plug. Do you know how, how people can get a hold of him and in what area he services? Well, he's in Jersey City, uh, New Jersey, and uh, yeah, I'm I'm gonna have all the details on the um, the post that I post uh, about the range test links and everything uh, to go there. But if you just jump on Toro uh, in the Jersey City area and look up Teslas, uh, he's uh, you know he's got 13 cars there. His name is out. He has a company. It's called Plug and Charge, uh, okay. and he actually has a website. That's I think it's just PlugInCharge.com. But uh, all the vehicles get rented through uh, through Toro, and you can get any model of uh, Tesla, pretty much, except a Roadster uh, that you want. Uh, if you want to check the car out, see if you want to buy one, or just use it for the day. That's a pretty cool business idea. Is that is that the uh, only like large uh, Turo Tesla Turo business that you know of? I, I'm sh I'm sure there's plenty of them out there. The only one that okay. I know, of, especially the only one local here in California, Toro is huge, much bigger than in some of the other areas, but, uh, here in New Jersey, um, I, I, he's the only one that I know of renting Tesla's at least. Wow. Right. You, There's, um, the, I was in California and you could see like one guy had probably a similar setup, probably 10 or 15 of them, uh, that he rents. I, I don't actually think his was through Turo, but I think his was a private business. Um, 
but yeah, pretty cool stuff. There's one last thing I'd like to just mention really quick before we go to the news, sure. which is a uh, talking about the Cannonball Records for electric yeah. cars. Um, you know, it's something that is uh, a run that goes from New York to LA, or in some cases, LA to New York. It, the traditional route is New York to LA. It's 2,850 miles from the Red Ball Garage in Manhattan on East 31st Street to the uh, Portofino Hotel and Marina in uh, Redondo Beach, California. And this is basically a run that's just, you know, it was in the 70s and 80s to protest speed limits. It's here's how fast we can get across the country. And since then, it's turned into a lot of uh, solo or small teams that blast across the country. And in recent years, it's turned into uh, showcasing electric vehicle uh, long distance capabilities, not necessarily driving 170, 180 miles an hour like a lot of the gas cars are blasting, but a lot of showcasing charging infrastructure and managing your time and speed. It's more of a giant math calculation that's pretty fun. And it's probably a more attainable cannonball, right? So this is the Hooniverse folks that did it in their Audi e-tron on the screen. That was a press car they ran it in. I love that. Uh, <laughs> so cool. And um, just last night, there was another attempt to break the current record. And um, oh, unfortunately, Kyle. they Kyle. did not come in. Can what? I interrupt for a second? So sure. in case our, our viewers don't know, and, and Kyle's very humble about this, but he is actually the, the current Cannonball record holder. And what, what's right. your time? It's uh, myself and Matthew Davis set the time uh, literally a year ago, July 31st uh, last year. We did it the 28th and 29th. Uh, it was 45 hours, 16 minutes in a Model 3 long range rear wheel drive that we had lowered and prepared specifically for this type of drive. Um, so I won't say who the team was. They haven't come public, but there was an attempt. There's been many attempts. I think there's been almost 10 attempts, but these guys definitely came the closest, but we're not able to uh, to break the record. But I want to say congratulations to them on a nice drive and also safety of the drive. There has never been a major accident involving another vehicle on a cannonball style event in history, uh, which uh, shows, you know, I'm glad they were able to keep that record there. Uh, you know, what's crazy is this type of drive really does feel like a very safe uh, kind of driving because you're constantly paying attention. You have a co-driver with you. You're monitoring the road. Uh, there's a lot of uh, deliberate moves. You're not just driving around aimlessly at 140 miles an hour. And uh, yeah, just Big congratulations to the team. It's a huge challenge going across the country in a time like this. I mean, we've done it and it was, you know, the gas cars, they're down to 25 hours and something, which is amazing. Um, but 25 hours is a day. The electric cars is two days of driving, right? So it's really, you're battling that sleep problem a lot. So, right. yep. Big congrats to that team for completing successfully and safely. Wow. You, you can catnap when you're supercharging? Your, uh, our average charging time on our run was 12 minutes. Ah, oh, jeez. So it's park the car, pee, maybe you have time to grab some beef jerky, which is the official food of Cannonball, and you're back on the road blasting. Man, 45 hours. That's So you don't really sleep during that time. That's crazy. I was able to take a, probably a one-hour nap while Matthew drove for one leg in Oklahoma in the middle of the first night. But other than that, we were awake the entire time. And so say I want to assemble a team and beat your record. Would I have to speed in order to do that? Oh, absolutely. There okay. is uh, the last run to really factor in and to uh, maybe adhere a little bit to the, to legal limits was Lars Thompson, a family, a good friend of mine, family from Switzerland, who had purchased a Model 3 brand new in New Jersey. It was like, you know, it was a 2017 or early 18 when they first came out. He had shipped it to Switzerland, drove it all around Europe. And when they finally brought the Model 3 to Europe with the CCS charging port, he had shipped this car back to the US, did a cannonball with his whole family, which was really great. And uh, I did my run just a couple weeks after his, but he was the last one to really stick to the speed limits. And before that, Alex Roy held the record. And uh, yeah, so it's a really cool lineage, but it's amazing. We've seen zero progress in long distance travel with EVs in one year. Uh, version three superchargers, there's only two along the route, which this new team were able to take advantage of. But again, two isn't really going to make that much of a difference over 26 charging stops. I think uh, the new Model S Raven should be able to do it better though, right? 
I don't know. I actually don't think so. You, you'd obviously get oh. initial on the first charge. Right. You would get uh, more range. But once it's dead, which the majority of it is how quickly can you get, you know, 150 kilowatts sustained in, and then you balance that with the vehicle's efficiency. Keep in mind, in the car we did it in, it was slammed on the ground. That thing would do 240 watt hour per mile at like 90 miles an hour. And so if you're cruising at 110, 120 you're not even above 300 or just slightly above. It's very impressive. Wow. Um, I have some advice. If you are going to attempt it, don't use your spark. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely not. I think it, out there. It's a great little car, but you probably don't want to try to set a cannonball with it. Yeah. Icon no. has a fighting chance for sure. Maybe, I, maybe it's Icon. Yeah, I've run the numbers. It's very close. It just comes down to will Electrify America charging stations plug and charge quickly because that seems to be the biggest risk with the Taycan. You have 270 kilowatt peak charging. It tapers, you know, let's say you can get to 50, 60 percent charge, still pulling 150 kilowatt, which is very good. Um, but at high speeds and, uh, you know, the, the Taycan isn't as efficient as Model 3 and you have this issue where you have to activate the Electrify America stations, which still plug in charge is not rolled out. So once plug in charge with VIN recognition rolls out and I have a Tycon on my hands, uh, I think it would make sense to at least see what it could do. But I, of course, have no plans to go and break my record. Right. Okay. Well, let's uh, let's dive in some, into some news here before the, the hour is gone. Um, so I guess the big news of the week is uh, Tesla. Their Q2 2020 production deliveries were 90,650 vehicles, which was uh, way above expectations. Um, and that's despite, you know, ramp up problems. I, th I think they had some supply issues at some point. And despite the COVID, they suspended manufacturing at, at Fremont, I think to some extent for like a month. Um, but they surpassed expectations and delivered all those vehicles, uh, maybe with or without a QC check. Uh, this gave the stock a boost. It closed up uh, $89.03 yesterday at $1,208.66. Uh, that's pretty crazy. Earlier this week, a Musk memo leaked out, uh, indicated there's a chance that Tesla could make a profit uh, for Q2. And the price, which had been around uh, $960 a share, has been creeping up and had also passed uh, $1,000 per share earlier. And that means that Tesla's market capitalization is now higher than that of Exxon, which is, I thought, kind of symbolic. You know, Exxon's actually lost a lot of value this year. Uh, but, you know, their energy companies, you know, are not the future. And electric vehicle manufacturers, apparently, according to the market, are. And and they also passed the market capitalization of Toyota, which is was the, the largest, you know, the, the most valuable um, auto automaker out there, and I, I guess you could still it's still a, the most valuable automaker out there. They they produce millions of vehicles, but um, but by market cap, Tesla has exceeded that. So that's that was pretty interesting. Uh, what do you have some thoughts about this, Martin? Yeah, and if you if people are watching, uh, not to patronize anyone, but if they're wondering why they made eighty two thousand and delivered ninety thousand, that's because they ended the previous quarter with a ton of inventory, and so they were they were dipping into their their inventory on that. As we saw last quarter, they are now uh, uh, batching together the S and the X and the three and the Y. So they made about 76,000 threes and Ys in the quarter. Really, really impressive when it was closed for seven weeks at, uh, at Fremont. Of course, Shanghai came to the rescue. And if it hadn't been for the Chinese uh, facility being up and running, it would have been a terrible uh, quarter for Tesla. But in comparison, when you look at that 76,000 three and Y and you look at 6,300 uh, S and X being made. It, it's just a reminder that these, uh, that the S and the X, they are much smaller scale, you know, obviously much more expensive and, uh, and not a huge part of the Tesla story anymore, even if they are, you know, incredible cars. Obviously, we have to point out they did so much better than was expected. Consensus was at something like 70, uh, in terms of the, the deliveries, about 72,000, I think, was the consensus from the, uh, the experts. People get paid to, 
to be knowledgeable about this. All of the experts were saying 72,000. I think on Inside EVs, uh, by last week, we were saying that is way, way too low from all the things that uh, were, uh, were, were, were coming out. So to deliver uh, 90,650 is just, uh, you know, an incredible job. It's it's an improvement on this time last year, which is fantastic when you, again, consider it was, you know, their, their, their main home was closed for uh, for seven weeks during the first half of the year. It's also proof as well. And this is just the ongoing story about electric vehicles, not just Tesla, but EVs everywhere. And it's always worth pointing out because... You know, that anti-EV story does creep into the media sometimes. And just we've you know always got to remind ourselves about this fact. They sell every car they can make. That's yeah. like that is apart from, you know, inventory. Yes, I know it's a tiny percentage. If Tesla can make a car, they can sell it. And, and, and I've, you know, even when the Model Y first went on sale, we saw those stories of uh, of questioning the demand, which I uh, just found crazy. Um, did the special offers help them make a bit more money because Elon's been tweeting about profitability? Well, they did have that offer on inventory cars getting free lifetime supercharging and some special offers on uh, full self-driving and, uh, and, and things like that. Um, as I say, Shanghai was, was huge and a uh, potential of, uh, I think well, the guidance for the year was 500,000 cars from Tesla. And then when COVID hit, everyone thought, well, that's, that's, you know, that's just not going to happen anymore. But actually China is ramping up three and Y very soon. Model Y is ramping up in China and it looks like 500,000 cards, cars is still on the cards for this year. An amazing success story for, uh, for, for, for Tesla, for electric vehicles, as you say, the tide turning, against those those kind of old fossil companies as well a really really good week for uh, for tesla and uh, you know elon following that up with a a letter of congratulations to the staff as well so that was my take on it i was uh, i was really really impressed elon, elon was doing some victory laps on uh, twitter yesterday as well besides besides his congratulations i didn't to want it. to mention sec <laughs> right he was taunting short sellers with the promise to produce a Fabulous short shorts in radi radiant red satin with gold trim, and he had the yeah, he had the little uh, a naughty SEC tweet as well. You y'all can look that up for yourselves and figure that one out. It's a little cryptic, but you'll you'll probably get it. Not not that cryptic. <laughs> <laughs> probably not figured it out. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, sticking with Tesla, uh, they've also scaled back their Berlin Gigafactory. Uh, uh, it's a little less giga than, we, than it was originally planned, it seems like. Uh, new planning documents were sent to authorities that reveal a building height that was reduced by 29 feet. That's like nine meters or more than a third. Uh, the plan also no longer includes battery assembly facilities and plastic components. So like as we discussed a few weeks ago, Elon took a trip to the UK and rumors were flying about building a gigafactory there. And I believe we, we agreed amongst ourselves that uh, it was more likely to be a, a battery factory and, and not for vehicles specifically. And now it looks like that may be the case. Uh, have you heard any, any more about that, Martin? That's yeah, not, far, not, not too far away from me. Um, it's uh, I'm southwest in a county called Dorset. And as the crow flies, it's all country lanes to, to, to get to, to Bristol. But as the crow flies, it's not far away. And that is where Elon is said to have visited. There is... Uh, some land there which has been allocated and the smart money obviously the speculation when you talk about tesla coming to a country are they going to build a gigafactory i would say no because making a car is basically you know a big jigsaw puzzle with lots of different parts now all those parts come from if you're building a car over here europe and uh, the, we're about to close our borders or at least Brexit at the end of the year. You, you just wouldn't make a big investment not knowing. And all those agreements haven't been made. So you don't know what the borders are going to look like. And it could be frictionless or actually a lorry being held up for four or six hours at the border for checks just destroys your just in time production process. I can't see a making cars here. Actually, what is more likely is uh, using some uh, some engineering talent that we have in this country for things like battery production and battery production for cars as well all the all you're doing is exporting then over to berlin gigafactory but also a uh, grid level storage as well much more likely and 
I'm surprised it's not happening because the site at Berlin is so huge. Right. Um, but just perhaps it's it's one of those things they got a stellar deal. You know, the UK government is on a massive charm offensive. Um, clearly, we have upset uh, Europe by voting um, to leave. And so uh, the Americans are our new best friends again. Uh, we, we always were. And uh, and so massive charm offensive uh, looking uh, rather than that way. We're looking that way across the Atlantic at uh, our big brother to come and uh, help us out with um, maybe some some deals. So that is the most likely thing at the moment. Right. I, I saw someone trying to tease some, some details about it from Elon on, on Twitter. And all he had to say about it was that uh, the, the US and the UK should have a free trade agreement. So it, it does seem like he's keen on having some sort of you know business set up going there. And they are they are hard up for batteries. We published a story that just this morning on Inside EVs that uh, LG Chem is going to produce Tesla batteries in South Korea this year as demand grows. And uh, we don't know if that's for... I would I'd imagine that's for storage, right? Kyle, are you are you familiar with this? Did you see this yet? No, I, I honestly I'm not up to speed on their plans on how to use the LG Chem battery, so I'm not right. totally sure. Right. Tom? Yeah, unfortunately, I read over the article briefly also, right. and it did, there wasn't a whole lot of meat in there, but uh, you know, I, 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 I like Kyle. I, I'm, I'm not fully up to speed on that one, unfortunately. I wish I could comment more on it, um, but uh, you know, it, it, it kind of makes sense. But uh, you know, I, I, I don't have too much more to say about it. Sorry about that. We, we should have no, talked about this before we, we doled out the, uh, the assignments. I mean, but as always, I bet you if you go to Martin, he'll, he'll know about it because. He's in touch with like everything. Okay, I'm putting you on the spot now, Martin. All I will say is that Elon has repeatedly said on uh, the investor calls that they are battery constrained. And uh, because of the relationship with Panasonic was so long and so exclusive and so harmonious and so tight as well, like investing in in sparks nevada uh, that no that whenever they they started to broaden their suppliers first it was catl and now with lg chem and making their own cells as we'll find out at battery day in september that it raises eyebrows but it's just it's very normal for a car company to have multiple suppliers working to the same specs i don't think this is anything more than that just them trying to solve a an upcoming battery squeeze a cell squeeze right i think they have a lot of energy products as well as their you know increase automotive supply they and with lg chem they already produce uh batteries for tesla in china in nanjing i believe uh, and yep. i guess that probably supplies tesla vehicles there as well as well as the cattle is also a supplier in china to tesla yeah and a lot of new buildings going up at uh, shanghai as well the you know the busiest places uh, at tesla factories are the, uh, the 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 drones above them so we watch these youtube videos all the time and there are some big big buildings going up at uh, at shanghai that uh, weren't on the original roadmap and so the smart money says it's just cell production or or, or battery production from the the cells they get shipped in um, or again a joint partnership like they had with uh, panasonic so it just points towards them just needing to source from as many places as they can to achieve all these things you know we haven't even got into uh, roadsters having 200 kilowatt hour battery right. packs although that is always described by elon as the as the the dessert so it's years away but right. okay so then say Cybertruck and say yeah. and, and say semi you know they th these are going to be so hungry for batteries yeah it's going to really have to turn that up to 11 battery production yeah the, the uh Cybertruck that comes with a 200 watt 200 kilowatt hour pack as well i can't remember yeah. so yeah and definitely definitely the next uh the next model model s uh, what do they call the uh, the super fast version, the tri motor version, the plaid version? Yeah, that's, that's yeah, right. Yeah, so plaid mode. All those I mean, things I, are being put into you know into place now. Even if you want to get really nerdy about this, they even changed their software architecture sort of programming this week as well to ready for that. So they went from ten bit to eleven bit, which means nothing apart from going from one o two four, which is one hundred and two point four kilowatt hours, to two o four eight, so two hundred and four point eight kilowatt hours. The maximum, but they were limited with the maximum size of the battery uh, they could put in simply because of of their their own software infrastructure so all these these little things it came out this week and uh, uh all these little things are just pointing towards soon an announcement on some much bigger battery pack sizes even like you know in plaid 
They right. need to. And, you know, it's the correct timing. They always stay nice and quiet at the end of the quarter. They let things settle down so that when they launch something new, the people who just took delivery don't riot because they've done that a few times in the past. Uh, and that was always a pain, especially while I was working at Tesla. And then, um, you know, I imagine in four to six weeks, we'll see something kind of cool. At least I hope. You worked at Tesla? Yep, for years. I did. Uh, sales and, and out of the east coast side over here and uh yeah every day i learned something totally new about you you're like this oh, international no. <laughs> man of mystery and like yeah absolutely not <laughs> yeah I, we uh you know to the tesla thing you know a lot of times we would have to deal with with buyers that would say you know should i buy a tesla now or should i buy a tesla in two months or right. you know and it's just like well, on one hand, when you buy a Tesla now, you're getting the best technology they've put in the line. On the other hand, tomorrow, they could launch unicorn mode and it flies to your destination, right? And right. by the way, you're not going to get a refund. And oh, by the way, you're stuck with your car. So you kind of just have to take a guess. Unicorn mode, I like that. If they should have glitter come out of, out of the, uh, the vents. That's right. Oh, gosh, how <laughs> awful would that be? <laughs> But kids but would mean, love it. About any technology, you could you could always wait another six months and get a better cell phone, a better laptop. You know the 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 Teslas are more tech than car anymore. So you know I, you know you ha you're, we're making we're already making those decisions in our everyday lives with everything we buy. It's just that the car is such a bigger purchase that you have for a longer period of time that you're just you want to make sure that, okay, if I buy this right now, tomorrow, there isn't going to be one that's better. Unfortunately, with Tesla, they just keep getting better. I mean, fortunately and unfortunately for those trying to decide exactly when to buy, it's almost like buying a stock. You know, when when do I put that money down? You know, should I right now or wait a week or wait till the end of the quarter? That's, you know, that's always been that way with Tesla. And, uh, you know, you, it, there's always going to be a better one in six months. Well, yeah, but you got the perfect timing on your car, Tom. I Just did. In terms of autopilot pricing and everything else, the options layout, you got right in at the right time. No, I, I, I have to admit I did. I'm, I'm a little disappointed that I missed out on the new New Jersey rebates, though, because now uh, the state of New Jersey has a $5,000 rebate, mm -hmm. um, which nice. I would have you know, been able to get, like if I were to buy a new model, a model Y. Yeah, if I were to if if I were to say trade my three in for a Y, I could get a uh, five thousand dollar state rebate. So um, you know, but other than that, you're right. I I actually lucked out and got it, picked it at a pretty good time. Nice. So we should move on to another bit of news. Um, so Xpeng, I think I pronounced that right, uh, starts customer deliveries of of its, of its P7 long range sports sedan, and I believe it's like four hundred and. 28 miles, but that's on the NEDC cycle, which is uh, extremely optimistic. So, Tom, what do you think this would get EPA range? So, yeah, it's 438 miles on the um, uh, NEDC range rating, um, but we have a good metric to go by. It's it's actually um, goes, tw it's rated at 24 miles more than the long range Model 3. It is the longest range electric vehicle, longest rated range electric vehicle available in China right now. So you could take the uh, you know Tesla Model 3 long range and add on, if it's 24 miles NEDC, add on say 12 to 15 miles. And that's what you can expect, you know, probably somewhere around 330, 340 miles. Um, somewhere in that in that range rating, if it were EPA range rated. Now, I was um, at the um, Guangzhou Motor Show last year when Xpeng uh, revealed this vehicle and got to see it up close. Beautiful car, kind of slots in between the Model 3 and Model S size-wise, but it's priced um, to be comparable to the Model 3. It actually starts at 32000 um, and goes up to 50,000, that's post subsidy, subsidies. Uh, so it's, it's actually very good value. Xpeng is like a value brand in, in, in China, but not cheap value, like the, as far as you get a lot for what you pay. Whereas Neo, for instance, is more of a luxury brand. And Neo's vehicles are priced 
much higher than Xpeng. The P7 is um, a very important car for, for Xpeng. It's their second vehicle. Uh, the first vehicle they came out with two years ago was the G3, was a compact SUV. Um, and that was made by uh, Haima Automotive, which is a subsidiary of, of FAW, which is a state-owned automotive company. Now in China, it's difficult to get a manufacturing license. Not everybody can, can get one. You first have to prove that you're, you're a competent company and that you make quality vehicles. It's, it's a long process. But Xpeng just got their own manufacturing license and opened up a brand new state-of-the-art factory. And that's where the P7 is being made. Um, and, uh, you know, the, 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 it, that's a huge deal in China that this new car company, it's only been out a couple of years, actually has their own manufacturing license, is, is making their own cars now. Um, and that, like I said, that's not to be under, underrated. Uh, the P7 has a, an 81 kilowatt hour battery. Um, it's uh, it's going to launch with level three driving capability. Um, and I'm, I'm going to hopefully get an opportunity to drive one. At the end of this month, Xpeng is exporting three of them to the U.S. They just secured a license to drive and road test the vehicle in the U.S. And um, I was uh, in uh, talking with Xpeng about this. And once, as soon as it comes over, they, they actually told me I was going to be either the first or one of the first people in the country to drive the, the new P7. So I'm looking, looking forward to that, to writing a, a thorough driving review of it myself. Wow, that's awesome. And, and so do they, have, do they have plans to come to the US? I think they're going to Europe for sure, right? I don't know if it's for sure. I know that there was, they've already brought some there to, uh, or uh, some uh, G3s to Norway uh, for people to do some uh, media drives and test drives. And I'm, I believe that they're going to bring to export the Martin might know that a little bit, but I haven't been following the, the European uh, deal with, with Xpeng, but I believe that that is the plan if it isn't secured yet. I see. So the G3 was what uh, Bjorn, Bjorn had a little while back. Yes. The, and this the, is the okay. SUV, which I drove in when I was in China. So do you think they'll bring it to the US, the P7? It's, if they're going to bring a vehicle, it would probably be the P7, and I don't know. I, I don't, if they do, it's not going to be for a while because it, it, there's a, there's a good demand for this vehicle in China, and they're just opening up the new factory. They're just right. you know ramping that up. The factory can make a hundred thousand cars a year. Uh, they had fifteen thousand pre-orders for the P7, and they just began delivering them. Uh, I think uh, you know like something like June. 28th or something like that a couple days ago it's definitely a brand new like i think 150 of them in the month of june and i, I saw the funny thing is i saw uh there was a a, a a a tesla uh fan website that posted that the p7 flopped in, in its first month of deliveries uh xpeng only delivered like 155 of them well it's because they they started delivering them on the last day of the month or the second to the last day of the right. month yeah <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of noise out there sometimes, signal the noise about uh, different cars from you know, different fan bases. But yeah. uh, it looks like the Xpeng might be one to keep our eyes on for a while as it relates to how it competes with uh, both Neo and Tesla in its home, home market in China. In my opinion, absolutely. Um, right. I, I, I got a factory tour, uh, uh, not a factory, their headquarter tour, headquarters tour when I went over there. I drove in the vehicle, met a lot of the the the, the company managers. Um, they seem they seem to really uh, have have it together and uh, have a very good chance of of uh, having some staying power. Xpeng, as far as I'm concerned, there's a lot of startup EV companies in China right now. Uh, you know, Xpeng is one of the ones that I think seems like they they have very secure funding. They have their own factory now, as I said, which you know, I, I that's think a big deal don't realize how important that is because of course they have their own factory. All car companies have their own factory, right? Well, that's not how it, it works in China. Neo, for instance, doesn't make their own cars, you know, so, uh, you know, that's the, the, they want to eventually, but uh, Xpeng kind of came out of nowhere and within two years of selling vehicles, they have their own factory. And uh, I mean, that bodes well for this company. Right. Well, skipping down our list of stories real quickly to hit, uh, we should mention that one company that isn't 
uh, going to be the next uh, Tesla in China is Byton. They've suspended their operations and furloughed employees, and the future is uncertain. Tom, you, you wrote about this. Yeah, so I I, I, I ha- maybe you shouldn't listen exactly to everything I've said about Xpeng because because I, Byton was one of the companies that I kind of was talking up um, a couple of years ago when I got to meet all the company executives and uh, I really thought that they had a, a, a very good chance of bringing this vehicle to production. Um, you know, they had a, they assembled a, tr- a tremendous team. One of the things that I really liked about Byton was they um, they didn't just, they were a Chinese startup. Yes, that's where the, the funding was, where the money was. But they went out and took executives and, you know, managers and, and you know, engineers from, they took BMWs, the BMW i, basically their whole top management structure. They brought in dozens of people from Tesla, from Apple, from Google, uh, you know, from Mercedes, from Toyota. They brought in people from all these industry, super experienced industry experts. So, you know, that that gave me confidence that, look, these people knew what they were doing. Um, so, uh, you know, the crazy thing is the, the, M, the M bike that you see there in the picture, that SUV, that's like ready for production. I drove right. it to CES in, 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 in Las Vegas in January. And the, the, they even have, and, and they're one of the other companies that got their own manufacturing license. One of the few companies that got their own manufacturing license. They built out a Nanjing, Nanjing uh, power uh, manufacturing plant. I was there, visited it, walked around, saw the, the pre-production vehicles there. They already have like 50 pre-production vehicles. They're ready to start selling this car in China in like six months. And they ran out of money. And right. uh, during the coronavirus, um, they couldn't get anybody to, to give them a bridge loan or, or invest in the company. So what happened was they stopped paying their bills. Right. And, uh, they, they're four months behind from what we understand on paying employees. And the power was shut off at both their um, Shanghai and Beijing off headquarter offices and the Nanjing production facility. So the power got cut off. They're four months behind on paying employees. And they just, you know, kind of abruptly notified all the employees that every everyone's being furloughed or laid off. And we need to uh, we need for six months, and we need some time to figure this out to see you know if the if we can go, move forward or how we'll move forward. Wow, that's unfortunate. Uh, but okay, um, so as yeah, sad as that is, let's move on to some a little better news. So Audi has bumped up the sportiness of its uh, electric line with 496 po- horsepower e-tron S and e-tron S Sport back models. Uh, these are three motor versions, two motors on the rear axle, one in front, 100 more horsepower, about a second quicker now from zero to 60, about 4.3, 4.5 seconds, and a six mile an hour faster top speed at 130 miles an hour. It also gets some uh, torque vectoring abilities. Uh, the bodies are uh, two inches wider, but that's just because it has uh, enlarged uh, wheel arches. And it has uh, new bumpers. The grille is a bit different, and it's going to be unique, I believe, to the the S models. It has a, a little bigger diffuser in the back. Uh, it hits European showrooms this fall, starting at uh, nine hundred or nine, ninety-three thousand eight hundred euros, or around one hundred five thousand two hundred forty-five. I'm choking on that money, jeez. Uh, and then the sport back, I believe, is ninety six thousand and fifty euros or one hundred seven thousand eight hundred dollars. Man, that's a lot of money. Kyle, how do you? But it's think- not. It's not out of. It's not a lot of money for the car. I really think it's priced properly. I think if you look at Model X, for example, this is a nicer car to be in. It's a nicer car to drive, no question. Uh, you know, if I, I, I've i spent quite a bit of time in the normal e-tron, this is a better car than the Model X. You know, you have to think about the charging infrastructure separately and things like that. Um, we all know Audi can build a solid product. We know the interiors are going to be amazing. We know the technology is going to be really good. It has three motors. They're the first to come to production with three motors, I believe, for a consumer uh, production electric vehicle. Uh it's going to be pretty fast. We've seen it ripping around the Nurburgring. It looks pretty sporty. And, you know, I tweeted about this too. I think this is going to be 
the ultimate dog hauler electric car. Now, if only they would make the RS6 wagon electric, I'd be all about that. But I'm really excited about this e-tron S, and I really hope they come out with an RS as well, um, because there's a lot of potential with this chassis. They definitely nerfed it on the uh, on the 55 Quattro or the 50 as well. You floor it; it doesn't feel that exciting. I think they probably unlocked some stuff with this car. As expected, Audi always comes out with their sporty models a year or two after start of production. So nothing out of the ordinary, very typical Audi. And uh, I think personally, a really enticing package, especially when they're 35 grand used in a couple of years. But, but compare that, okay. So, but compare that to the Mercedes uh, EQC. They're very different. How, how so? So, like the the base e-tron would compare to the EQC. The EQC is much more focused on luxury and comfort, and because it's an EQC and not an EQE or EQS, it's still technically their baser model uh, SUV. I mean, it's not supposed right. to be their luxury trim. The e-tron uh, is fitted with a lot of the stuff that you get on the Q7 and Q8, which is their higher model. Uh, SUVs. So they're really sort of competing in a little bit of a different category. Um, although they will get pe- compared often, I honestly think that Mercedes EQC is so ugly, I would never drive that. And uh, no, thank you. But really? um, just based on styling. But I think the Audi, they have nailed it. They have absolutely nailed it on the e-tron S. And the sad part is no one's going to care, but I will root them and cheer them on. Because I was thinking that the like the acceleration and the speed and performance the, um, of of the EQC was very similar to that of the of the e-tron S. Yeah, it's very possible. I honestly don't know uh, the e- the EQC specs off the top of my head, but Tom has driven the vehicle, and based on my conversations with you, Tom, you had made it seem like it's a much more comfortable, uh, luxurious, like a Mercedes should and traditionally has been. Is that correct? Yeah, I was able to not drive it, but drive in one. The Mercedes engineer was driving, but we ripped around Red Rock Canyon out in um, Nevada, uh, it, right at like a uh, pre-dawn drive as the sun was coming up. Got some great pictures of the vehicle with the sun rising. But the engineer really was ripping around these turns. I was I was actually super impressed with how well the vehicle did. Uh, you know, I, I wasn't expecting that from the EQC and uh, it, was a great, it was a great performer. It, did, it, it absolutely shocked me. Um, you know, it, w- it would have, in my opinion, run circles around a regular e-tron. Now this, the, the e-tron S, that's a different story. Uh, the, you know, I'd love to get the e-tron S sport back out on your track. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and and see how uh, well that is, or maybe let you drive it and be a passenger. Um, Let's talk about this sport back track perfectly. <laughs> what do you guys think about? And this is a very German thing. We've seen it with X5, X6, now Cayenne and Cayenne Coupe. Does it make sense to charge more money for a less practical, uglier version of the same car? What, more more beautiful think? version, yes. So you actually think it looks better in sport back trim? I like the Cooper five SUVs. I can't help it. I know that's wrong. Wow. I, yeah. I, like, See, I, I have looks. zero appeal for me. I'm very surprised. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I personally like the Sportback a little better. And I was at, that's another vehicle I was able to drive in um, out at um, CES. And when it was first, when they were first announcing it. So I personally like that vehicle better. Um, but I, I, I'll be honest with you. When I, when I drove in it, they hadn't announced pricing yet. And I thought that it might, um, be priced a little bit less than the the, the larger e-tron um and uh you know pr- i perhaps should have uh looked into how uh, audi's pricing structure is with their other models but I, I was looking at this and saying wow maybe if, if we can get this for like say five grand less than 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 the larger e-tron this isn't a bad deal but but then it ended up being more you know so uh um, but I like I like the form factor of that better than the the e-tron. It had plenty of room inside for me personally. I didn't need the the full size e-tron, and it, it just it drove better, it it, it handled better, uh, and and I like the way it looks better. So uh, 
me and Dominic are against you on this one. Uh, that's fine. I, I, that's why we do this show because everyone has different opinions. Mine are extremely strong towards uh, away from EQC, away from Sportback, and I really love this uh, Etron S. I think it's going to be a cool car. Three motors. That means torque vectoring on the rear axle. Right. You yeah. can send it sideways. Do big skids with the dog hanging out the back. It's just going to be the best. <laughs> it's funny yeah, yeah. how Kyle envisions everybody as him. Right. <laughs> this is my biggest problem in life. No sliding sideways. No. Right. Right. I think uh, the, the old, they should build a Kyle spec electric car one day that will only fit me because it's going to be a station wagon with a lot of storage and a thousand horsepower. It's going to be really stupid. <laughs> yeah. We need some more stupid EVs. There's just, yeah, there's still this, the, uh, and the variation of different, you know, kinds of vehicles is still still a little limited, you know. In, yeah, in it's the, boring. We need someone to come out with wings. I guess the Model X does, but like flamboyant, uh, interesting things. We have an entirely new platform to move the car. Right. Uh, let's see more. Even though I don't personally like the Cybertruck, I love the creativity. I want to see more of this from other manufacturers. Right. We did reports uh, this week on an EV fire engine, so uh, I'd quite That's like true. to get that on on your truck on your track as well. Yeah, <laughs> that was really cool. It's a plug-in hybrid, I believe, right. with a diesel. And, yeah. What a great idea because you need instantly, you start that thing up, you're wide open throttle pulling out of the garage. You got to get there. Electric torque is going to be really great. And it gives the engine a chance to catch up. I love the concept. It's a, it's a hybrid, but apparently it has a, it doesn't say, we don't say uh, how much battery it has, but it does have a lot, I guess, that they don't expect it to use, uh, you know, this diesel engines very often. So, and it's from, it's from Volvo. It's got the Volvo Penta drivetrain in it. And I believe that's a little different from the Volvo cars that we're used to. I think it's a separate company. They are separate. And even Volvo European trucks are separate from Volvo US, but they still use the same iShift transmissions, which are awesome. They're the best trucking transmissions, automatic ones out there. Um, I actually had a chance to recently tour the US Volvo truck plant in Virginia uh, not too long ago, and they are preparing for electrification of trucks here in the U.S., which is very exciting. Oh, that's cool. I'd like to get behind some electric trucks. I, I, I drove a lot of uh, box trucks, you know, a while back, and, you know, I, I really loved, like, the big shifting and big wheel and, and you know, just driving the experience of a big truck, and I'd like to, ha like to have that mixed with the electrification and actually get some, like, some – speed ish a little bit you know because when you pull yeah. it on the highway you know you're going through the gears it's not fast so yeah, i've never uh, driven a truck i've been very interested in trying one but it gave me I, I don't know if you guys have seen but in las vegas you can go to this place it's a giant open dirt field that's right off the strip and you can just drive heavy machinery we should do something where people can come <laughs> to the track and just drive electric trucks that'd be that'd be so nice Wow. Okay, we should move on real quick. Uh, we're over the hour, but uh, we want to mention that the uh, Toyota Rav Four that everyone's been uh, quite excited about, and for good reason. Uh, its availability is uh, extremely limited in the U.S. and in Japan. I guess I think Japan is going to be limited to like three hundred copies this year, something like crazy. And and in the U.S. for twenty twenty, it looks like it's going to be only available in Zev states and which is like 10 of the states, California, I can't even think of them off the top of my head, and only 5,000 units. Uh, maybe next year we might have as many as 20,000. I think that, that's still a little squishy, that number. But 5,000 is, man, there's going to be a lot more demand than that for it, I think. That uh, that three hundred number is monthly, by the way, in uh, in Japan. Oh, is it? okay, right, right, yeah, right. Um, but, but, 3, uh, still, come on, it's Toyota. They're making millions, tens of millions of cars, and then... They'll make 300 of these, uh, and of course, they'll get to the end and say, well, we, we, we didn't sell many of them, so nobody wants to buy a plug-in car. We told you so all along. You should have listened to us and bought the fuel cell cars that we haven't invented yet, but they are the future. Uh, no, buy a soft plug -in, a soft hybrid instead, not one of our plug-in cars. Very frustrating. We have been so complimentary about this car on this podcast, rightfully so. 18-kilowatt-hour battery, 16 usable, probably, but four-wheel drive, great utility, great price, well put together. Fantastic. They could have sold a ton of these in the US, but no, they're not going to make many of them. 
Uh, Im immensely frustrating. Enormously. I mean, I mentioned uh, supply constrained EVs at the beginning of this podcast with, with, with Tesla, but this is just taking the biscuit. It's just the most ridiculous for a company, the size of Toyota. It's a, it's, it's spare change down the back of the sofa from them. It's a rounding error. Like, oh, did we make some of those? Oh, okay. No. It's, it's, it's nothing. Kind of, it's nothing for Toyota. It's pretty disappointing, actually, that they're not being a lot more ambitious about this. And it's not even going to come to Europe. I don't. I think in Europe you're going to get the Suzuki Across, which was another story we had, uh, which is the Rav Four, but with a, a little bit different grill and a few other touches. You you know about that too, Martin, right? Yeah, I was going to say badge badge engineered Rav Four mm -hmm. coming here at Suzuki, but it's got a different. Uh, grill and a couple of other things but they won't sell that as a toyota here they'll sell it as a, a suzuki across um you no know, suzuki a, a brand with you know heritage doesn't mean anything um i don't know how many are sold here every year it's not going to be a lot um i would have yeah i would have sold it as a as a toyota and um but maybe they will maybe they'll sell both uh, as uh, as the same car uh i just hope they make a few of them because it's a really good plug-in um if for, for what it does, you'll do all of your miles Monday to Friday, and probably all of your miles on electric if you charge at home overnight. What, what's the all electric the range? That size. What, what's the all electric range? What did it, it would have tipped at forty, didn't Third, it? it like Forty miles. Yeah, yeah, right around. Yeah, it, it but this changed. shows Toyota that there's really a demand. I think it's shocking them. They even came out with a release that's like, "Whoa, we sold out." Uh, so this of is they sold thing. out. Of course yeah. they sold well, out because they're not making any. I understand, <laughs> but it, this might be what's been needed to get it into their heads that people want cars with plugs. Right, and especially from brands that you know people really know and, and really you know, have a lot of confidence in, you know, Toyota is like, a, you know, the top brand, really. I, I'm not so sure that this surprised them, the demand. You know, I, this is a large, sophisticated company that does tons of market research. I think they knew all along. I think they knew how many they were going to make. They let the, the whole press and the media, you know, fawn over the vehicle when they announced it with the price and the range, and they got all that great PR out of it. And then they're like, okay, in a month later, we'll drop the hammer on them and tell them we're only making a couple of these. Uh, you know, it just fits so in line with how Tesla has has just been so a uh, Tesla. Toyota has been so anti plug in vehicle. Uh, th this wasn't. Uh, oh wow, look how many people want to buy. They knew. I mean, you know how they how contracts go with suppliers. They, you know that. The, the, they didn't just find out that they can't get enough batteries. Uh, you know, if that's even the reason, are they really supply constrained? As Martin mentioned, they're such a big uh, manufacturer. They have so much leverage over, over, you know, suppliers that they could, they could get more batteries. Now, maybe they couldn't get as many as Tesla makes now, but they, they could definitely get enough to sell, you know, a fairly significant number of these cars. They just don't want to sell them. Let's let's just put it out there. They don't want to sell these cars. That's kind of crazy. But uh, so one car that I mean, they have to they have to pick it up, or, or they're going to lose. You know, uh, what do you call that? First mover status. You know, you get to the market first, like Tesla. You, you know, you you sell the majority of the vehicles. If you like slow to market. You know, you're not gonna. There's only so much you know, cheese to go around, and so Ford is uh, going to be one of the bigger competitors here because they have their Mach-E coming out. Is it by the end of the year or first? The, you know, right around that by time. By the end of the year, still. And and now they're it's getting a performance boost before it even launches. The they just announced uh, the extended all-wheel drive, extended range all-wheel drive version gets 14 more horses, 11 more torques. Uh, the extended range rural drive, eight horses, 11 torque. They all actually they all have the list of all the cars here and they all get 11 more uh, feet, foot pound of torque. And, uh, you know, it's ranging between eight, eight to 14 additional horsepower and the standard range all wheel drive and the standard range rural drive both get 11 more horses. I'm not sure how that um, translates into performance boost, but I imagine it's a little bit something. Yeah, I don't think you'd really be able to feel it. But I think what Ford's doing, what we've seen is, you know, they've been pumping the PR on this car, sure. not anything bad. You know, they invited us to that 
that launch where we were able to drive it virtually. They've been putting out their own videos. They've been putting out like a, at least two press releases a week, it seems recently. Uh, and I think it's all to build up the awareness before the vehicle comes on sale. Um, not anything uh, out of the ordinary, but it's all good. And I think Ford took the right approach of, uh, you know, under promising and now over delivering at least on specs. And exactly. uh, yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense in their, their court. Remember that this announcement came on Monday, which was uh, the 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 suddenly finding fourteen horsepower like a set of car keys they'd misplaced came on the day that the order books opened. It was no coincidence. They've been sitting on it for a while. No bad thing. It's look, it's their job to jump drum up interest. Uh, I'm just pointing out the happy coincidence. Oh, thanks for mentioning that, Martin. I forgot. That's yeah. They also announced that um, you res if you reserve the car now, now is the time to. To convert that to a pre or a firm order so yeah get in touch with your dealer if you have a reservation in i'm going to talk about this for a half a second i'm okay. sorry yeah but, no, i'll tell you it's in there i have i have joined the mock e owners group on facebook yeah. i know not that i'm having one but uh i have seen extremely varied uh experiences with ordering Mustang Mach-E. Some are having a great experience with their dealer. They're on it. They know what to do. Other dealers haven't even signed up to accept online orders. So people have put in orders and they've just gone nowhere. I haven't heard back. Uh, there was one individual, I, I should have screenshotted it, but he has been on the phone with like head of uh, their internet sales and like everything. He just wants his car and it's been very difficult. So I think... Um, this will be an interesting one to watch unfold as time goes to see if this is the correct approach to trying to go Tesla style, but still having to keep your dealers happy because that's exactly what's going on here. Yeah. It's a, uh, you got to understand that they Ford has very little options there. They, they, they'd love to sell cars direct. So would all the manufacturers. I've talked to representatives from all the manufacturers in the U.S., they would every manufacturer would love to go direct, but they can't. You know, they've got this dealer network that the laws are extremely tight, uh, you know, and, and what you're going to get is like any private business. There's going to be a certain percentage of the dealerships that are fantastic, a certain percentage that are mediocre. And then there's a percentage of them that are just poorly run private enterprises. And, uh, you know, I'm, 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 I haven't seen the comments that you're talking about, Kyle, but. I'm sure it's along those lines that, you know, uh, I'm intimately aware of this stuff. One of the things I do full time is work with dealerships and train them on how to better sell electric vehicles. And I've, you know, seen some dealerships that are just disasters, that not just with electric vehicles. They're just terribly run dealerships. They're just poor business people. And then other dealerships that are like just on top of everything. And, you know, so, you know, it doesn't surprise me. You're going to get that. And, uh, you know, until we figure out a way of having some type of an evolution in how we sell vehicles in the U.S., and it's going to need sweeping changes in the, in the laws on how cars are sold, um, you know, we're going to get this. There's going to be a percentage that, that are terrible and a percentage that are good. Yes, definitely. So it's, uh, yeah, it's uh, the 4th of July weekend. It's a holiday here in the U.S., so I think we're going to, cut it now and uh, that brings us to the end of our show uh i'd like to wish you all a very happy fourth of july and if and a, a slightly belated uh canadian uh independent uh, canada happy canada day um so thank you all for joining us and you if you have any comments about any of the topics on today's show you can comment on the inside evs podcast post the youtube comment section of course we'll check that out and on the inside evs forum podcast thread where we collect all the episodes and don't forget you can find and follow our panelists here on twitter tom is at tomalog uh martin is at ev news daily kyle is at out of spec and i'm at dominic underscore y uh click and subscribe click subscribe and tap that bell notification bell icon for notifications and we'll see you all again next week Thank <laughs> you.